the story goes that after the Buddha's awakening, after he'd been experiencing the bliss of release for seven weeks, he thought about the prospect of teaching what he had learned to other people. And at first he was discouraged, because what he had learned was very, was very subtle. He said, dependent core arising, the principle of this, that, conditionality. He thought it would be impossible to teach anybody what he would learned, because he had been through an awful lot, of course. He was wondering how many other people would be willing to go through that. That's when the Brahma came down and begged him to teach, saying that there were, were people with little dust in their eyes. And they would benefit from hearing the Dharma. So the Buddha surveyed the world again, and he saw that, yes, it was true. There would be people who would benefit. And so he decided to teach. And he ended by saying, Open are the doors to the deathless. Let those with ears put forth their conviction. So we have ears. And it's looking at that possibility that there is a deathless happiness, a happiness that you don't have to create, a happiness that you don't have to protect once you found it, because it's just there, and it's totally beyond the touch of any conditions. And so it requires conviction, one conviction that such a possibility is there. And the path to it requires conviction as well, because it's not necessarily an easy path. It requires persistence, as a John Fuhring once said, and it's a pun in Thai. He says we have to do something that's just a little bit, but we have to keep at it. And it's the keeping at it that's the hard part, because the little bit is just being mindful, being alert. But the keeping at it means we have to protect that mindfulness, protect that alertness, because it's so easy to throw it away. And that can be really hard, because we have a lot of other agendas in our lives. Some agendas don't even like the idea that there might be a deathless happiness. In which case, we're basically destroying ourselves, but we destroy ourselves because we see easy happiness all around us. The pleasures of having a family, the pleasures of having money, the pleasures of having a job. And we'd rather not look at the, the pain that comes with having a family, the pain that has, comes with having money, the pain that has, comes with having a job. But we see at least that these pleasures are visible, here and now. And for something we haven't yet seen, we're sometimes not willing to make the gamble, especially when we see that the path requires sacrifice. You have to give up certain of your pleasures, but that's, that's the way it is with the world. It's only the human potential movement that has told us that if we cultivate our potentials, then we can have everything we want. Beauty, wealth, power, a great spiritual life, a great sexual life, the whole, the whole schmear. Part of us would really like that. But if you ever look at people who've tried to excel in every area of their life, you find that it drives them crazy. It's a basic principle that some forms of happiness, some forms of pleasure require that you give up other ones. So that's a given right there. The question is, what kinds of happiness, what kind of pleasure are you going to take as your primary focus? How high do you want to set your sights? What possibilities for happiness do you want to take into consideration? We have the testimony of the Buddha, we have the testimony of his noble disciples, the monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen.
put his teachings into practice and found that, yes, they work. There really is a deathless happiness. As one of the Taijans said, if they could take out and show that happiness to everybody else, nobody would want any other happiness in the world, especially any happiness that would get in the way of that true happiness. But it's something that's totally experienced within the mind, within your awareness. As the Buddha said, it's something you touch with your body, so it's not just an idea you have in the mind, but it's a full experience. But until you've touched it, it's just words, ideas, somebody else's news. This is where you have to put forth your conviction. One, that it's possible that they've done that, and two, that it's possible that you could do it too. Again, part of the mind wants that possibility. A part of the mind seems to be afraid of it doesn't want to go near. And it's very easy to listen to people that tell you, oh, that kind of happiness is not really true, or maybe the Buddha was just having a weird psychological experience and maybe didn't really know what he's talking about. And we can just go ahead and just live our lives and try to satisfy ourselves with our <coughs> sensual, sensual pleasures, our relationships, whatever, and simply accept the fact that someday we're going to have to die and that's it. And they accuse Buddhism of being pessimistic. And there's that part of us that wants a true happiness, a happiness that's not going to turn around and bite us. I was reading a book a while back that's saying that part of growing up is realizing that you have to make compromises and have to settle for less than the best. And so in that sense, the Buddha never really grew up. He had the young person's sense of idealism that maybe we really could find a true happiness and maybe you can do it through your own efforts. It's interesting that when he goes and argues with teachers of other traditions, there's only one teaching that he really takes on, the teaching of determinism, that everything you do or say or think or experience is based on what's already been done, either the will of a creator or just simple impersonal fate or your own past actions, that these totally control what you're going to experience. And he says, if you had that idea, then the idea of finding true happiness means nothing. And it's strange that over the centuries, even within Buddhist circles, the Buddhist teachings on karma have been taken to be deterministic. But they're not. There's that element of freedom. When he said that this, that conditionality is subtle, I heard one Buddhist scholar say, well, he's basically saying that causality happens. There are causes and effects. That was it. Well, that's not subtle at all. What's subtle is the fact that some of the things you experience are determined by your past actions, but not everything. You have freedom in the present moment to shape the potentials coming in from the past. Where does that freedom come? That's kind of a mystery. That's what's really subtle. And that's what you want to explore. When the Buddha started his teachings, but it starts with generosity. And he wasn't just mouthing platitudes. The experience of generosity is probably one of your first tastes of freedom as a child, that point where you realize that you have something that you can give to somebody else and nobody's forcing you to give it, but of your own free will you decided to give it away. And the same with the precepts. There are cases where you know you can get away with killing or stealing or illicit sex or lying, taking intoxicants, but you choose not to. You're not necessarily a slave of habit. And even though you can think of some immediate rewards that may come from breaking the precepts, you're able to say no. That right there is an experience of freedom. This 
ability to choose that we have. And in the beginning you take it on conviction that it can this ability to choose really is free and it really can take you far. But if you don't believe in that, what what meaning is there to life? They would have said them the idea of a holy life would be impossible in a deterministic universe, but if you take it a little bit further, the idea of any kind of meaning in life is impossible in a deterministic universe. There's no way you can prove that the universe is or is not deterministic. This is why conviction is required. When the Buddha talks about faith and conviction, he's not talking about having to believe in things that make no sense. We've experienced that in Western religions, which is why many of us shiver at the idea of faith. What the Buddha is simply asking is to believe in something that makes sense, but something you can't prove yet. which is the method of any scientist. Scientists have to go on a hypothesis that there are patterns, or laws they call them, in the way the universe works, and that you have the freedom to design an experiment to test those laws. And that when you design a good experiment, okay, it's your responsibility that you design that good experiment. If you design a bad experiment, you have to take responsibility for the fact that it was badly designed. So even science has that paradox, on the one hand believing in patterns, but also believing in free will. The practice of science. Now there's some scientific theories that would try to deny free will, but the actual practice depends on believing in free will. What the Buddha is doing is taking that paradox and saying, well, let's explore and see how far that can take us in the pursuit of true happiness, the pursuit for finding an end to suffering. And so our laboratory is right here in our body, in our speech, and our mind, particularly as we get to know our intentions better and better. This is one of the reasons why we meditate. We get the mind still, we keep it here at the breath. The mind in concentration is actually taking one intention and learning how to hold on to it. This is a really good way of learning about intention, because once you try to hold on to one intention, you start seeing other intentions coming up that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. Then you realize you have the choice which intention to follow. And so you make this your experiment. See what happens if you stick with this one intention, just to stay, stay, stay with the breath. And then you have to use your discernment. One, to make the breath interesting so it's easier to stay. And then two, if there are other intentions that come up that are really tempting, you have to figure out ways around them not to fall for them. So the discernment the Buddha is talking about is a pragmatic matter. It's not, not just knowing the Four Noble Truths or knowing the Five Aggregates or knowing any of the terms that the Buddha uses. It means knowing how to put them to use and being strategic and figure out what's skillful and what's unskillful and how to talk yourself into doing the skillful thing that you might not want to do, or out of doing the unskillful thing that you might want to do. That's all in this. You, you get to know your intentions better and better. And the better you get to know your intentions, the closer you get to understanding what this freedom is. And as you examine even your state of concentration, you find it can become more and more refined as you refine your intention, refine your awareness. And then you develop discernment in two ways. One is looking at ways that the mind would leave concentration to take up an object. What's motivating it? Why did it have that intention to go out there? In other words, you're not looking so much at the object as you are looking at the process that wants to go to the object. Or you can look at the intentions that are making up your state of concentration. To what extent do they place a burden on the mind? You can watch this and see the, the ups and downs of your concentration, the ups and downs of the 
level of stress in your concentration, and that we begin to detect very subtle movements of the mind that otherwise you wouldn't have seen. And you peel away any of, the, any of the motions of the mind you can see are obviously causing stress, or maybe not so obviously, but when you can detect it. And you can also detect the connection between a movement in your intention and the movement in the level of stress. You start peeling these things away until finally there is a moment where you, there's no intention. There's not even the intention not to have an intention. You just, the intention just stops because you realize there's no way any intention would not involve some level of stress. And that point of freedom is where everything opens up. And as the Buddha said, that's where your conviction becomes verified, that there really is a deathless. The door has been opened. You've gone through the door. And from that point on, you'll never doubt any, anything the Buddha says about the practice again, because you know that it worked, has worked for you. Even though you may not have gone all the way, you've used it. at least you've had that taste, you've seen that glimpse. You realize that what was originally just word about a possibility has been, been realized. It really is possible. But as you listen to this, again, it's still just news, and it's up to you to decide whether you're going to put forth your conviction. But you look around at the alternatives. What other things would you like to be convinced of? Would you like to be convinced that human life is really nothing much, just people scrambling to feed themselves and clothe themselves and reproduce? so that other people can feed themselves and close themselves and keep on reproducing, which gets pretty pointless. Is that what you want to be convinced of? Or do you want to be convinced that there is a possibility? You can find a deathless happiness, and you can do it through your own efforts. You've got the potential. The choice is yours.